<laughs> okay, so welcome to XP Manchester. There's quite a few new faces here. So uh, again, for future reference, and we'll be clearer about this on uh, invites and stuff in the future. We normally start at seven o'clock. Uh, doors open at half six, which is uh, why we've had this long wait at the beginning. Um, so tonight we're going to be having a conference call about microservices. So as we said earlier, if you want to speak, um, come up and sit down. There can only be four people sat down at a time. So if someone comes and sits down, someone in the middle has to go and sit at the edge. If that makes sense. Uh, so I thought a good starting point might be for everyone to discuss what, what they think a microservice is. So let's start us off someone. Um, well, I've not read a lot on it, but I don't think there's a strictly strict um, prescribed way of building a, a microservice. It's more of a philosophy. You might have a messaging into an action. Um, <coughs> words that are coming out here. Um, you might have a direct service to service communication, or you might have a, a, a messaging a message box in the middle, but start at the beginning. Um, Microservice is, is a service that does one thing, does it very well. Um, it, it's very low scope, so it's not got it's not, not like a monolithic service where it just knows about everything. Um, it um, it supports failure, um, and um, you build a system from a uh, lots of microservices, uh, and sort of compose them together. And the idea of that is you don't end up with this monolithic beast. Of an application, um, yeah. Is that is that is that one? What's your Um Microservice is way to give your operations people a really big job to do. Oh yeah, yeah. that's microservice architecture. So if you have a set of small services, yeah, oh, you've got one big problem. Things. Let's just spread it out. Spread the problem across multiple places and just make it. Uh, small problems in multiple places, but it's not. I suppose it's not. It's not a big problem. Um, my view on microservices, I suppose, is something that was we always did at different levels. Um, if somebody's, I think when you talk monolith and you talk about coding, for example, I think we all understand code here. Um, I hope. If not, that's fine. I hope you'll learn a lot today. <laughs> but. In coding, you have that monolithic app. Let's say you build a .NET application that all the domain knowledge of your your application is in one project, and that project, I don't know, you sell your I don't know, you sell beach balls, and you put every all the knowledge, all the business logic about beach ball sale within one app, and then one day you come in and say, "Port, this is really hard to manage. How can we, what can we do to break it up?" So you decided, well, we start. I, a microservices, I think, is more, it's the idea that we, we always did that. We just now brought it to the service layer where we look at this monolithic application in with our ways and how can we discover, create bounded contexts, separate them into smaller chunks so we can manage them better. So you might say the sale part of the, of the website, you actually move into a separate DLL where it's easy to manage. So if you, you can just go in and just change the sale DLL. And then comes the other idea about, well, if we, we make, if I want somebody else to consume the DLL, we might, wow, well, let's put the DLL on new get, or I could create a service. Well, you, say, you say that yeah. we've always done this, but as, a, as an industry, we're spectacularly bad at it generally. We're bad at everything. We, 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 it's shown by, I mean, it's a good example, one of the work that I used to work with a guy, uh, I used to work for a place called uh, Dr. Chambers, they do medical legal, legal documents, and one of the contractors was building a, smart client application uh, and uh, we had the GPs coming in testing the app and the GP said to me one day after talking to him we have a word for developers in the medical industry I said really yeah we have a saying I said well, what is it developers are the dentists of the software industry the work, the work is really expensive and it's crap <laughs> so uh, we are it is not every way it's, it's a generalization but we we, we tend to hear buzzwords like, well, you know, microservices, the current buzzword, and people saying, what is microservices, is this and that, and we... People saying, 
we want to do this. We want we'll to do, do it. We'll just introduce this yeah. complexity into our own. Okay, it's supposed to make it simpler, right? I think that the, way, the way they came about is due to the complexity. Yeah. And due to the problems with, let's call it a monolithic system, mm -hmm. whether that's a solution with eight different projects, so you're breaking things into different sort of chunks, like a repository pattern, you've got entities, you've got a service layer. You know, but it's all kind of in the same mix, and there's a lot of complexity there, especially yeah. when you're trying to enhance the system and take it a different direction. I think that's where microservices has come from. It's trying to deal with that complexity by saying, well, let's just build these discrete things that do one thing really well. Um, my issue with it um, is that you might end up duplicating, you know, like one service does one thing, I don't know, take a, um, deals with an order that's come in, mm -hmm. puts into the system. So that's got to have a view of an order. So you have like an order entity and it might have some business logic. And my worry is now, that. Now, would you? Wouldn't you just instead go and call the, uh, the order so the the process? The, the put and get order yeah. service. Instead, you're dealing with the order, dealing with the order that might not be. Uh, for example, where we where I work, we have a we have static data about a, spe a specific uh, stock items where literally it's just yeah. read only. That's all it does. Yeah. Somebody wants to read the stock item, they go to the service, they read the stock item, but the service has no no logic whatsoever. It's just for you to read yes, the stock item. Service it's pretty small. It's just for that, yeah. and it's not for anything else. So if you want to talk about the order bit, somebody has to go and build the order service. Yeah. You know about this item because the, this service doesn't doesn't care about orders, just care about this specific stock item, this product, if you like. Sure, I mean that's a good, a good example, a good use. I, I was just trying to think of places where you'd have different services doing different things, but they, they, they need the same kind of entity, and you kind of duplicate. I, I feel you, there's a danger of duplicating. So duplicating cool. behavior. when you yeah, go on. It's not really duplication. It's just it's the same thing as an order. Yeah, but. This service may think about the order in a different way. Sure, it's a different uh, context, doesn't it? So I mean, yeah, any other service that needs an order, and that, that thing, and if I put, you have to take the scenario where we have an order object and you have an order service, if somebody wants to read an order, they don't go to the database, they go to the order service. You don't duplicate the access to the data. You don't, don't allow people to access order in different ways. If somebody wants an order, they get it from the order service, and that's it. Otherwise, you, that is, how can you abstract how can you start? Uh, uh, you basically. Uh, how can you abstract the, your 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 data if you allow multiple people to have different views of it? Well, this is part of the the, the argument for yeah. the, the, the making it less complex. You're yeah. dealing with one one or, or a small number of concepts at a time, yeah. rather than potentially reaching around to different bit of the system, grabbing that because you can, sticking that in the database because you can, grabbing this out of the database because you can. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Exactly. And therefore, if, as soon as you if, if you break that down, you can start yeah. to say, well. This service also needs the order as well as the order service. So you may as well just abandon it, or you know, all you've done then is just create a monolith with distribution. Yeah, and distribution but that's, is hard. It, is. it is distribution is hard, uh, but it, 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 we're trading, making a trade. trade so you trade off about you know you have this this huge blob that takes a lot of people to move, or you can, but if, what if we break up this huge blob, create some sort of duplication because you need to. You need you, you will, you're gonna there will, there will be certain certain situations you have to make that decision that trade you know you know I, you know I have to do this and have to take this hit because yeah. I can't do it otherwise. I think that's what I'm trying to say at the yeah. beginning. Like there's not a set prescribed way of doing it. It's, it's all about the engineering trade off of when it's yeah, good it's all way to do it this way or do it that way. Is what I was trying to say. But, but um, this, this is why this is why the whole thing about <coughs> simplicity. The microservices give you simplicity. Is bollocks <laughs> because. All, <laughs> All you do it doesn't, you're doing, you, you play, you play Mac mode. So basically, you make it simpler for the developers because they're dealing with one concept at a time when they work with sure. services. Yeah. And you just make it far more difficult in terms of deployment, in terms of operation, in terms of cost. Mm. You know, all the results. So if, if, if people say, okay, what? How many repository? How many microservices do you have per repository? Yeah. If you have one microservice per repository, and a microservice is I think code that fits in yeah, yeah, like code on. that fits in your head. You know, so two 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 pages full of code. Then I want some shares in GitHub because you know that, and so, also AWS. Yeah, yeah go on. <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't agree more. <laughs> <laughs> you need to. Yeah, you have to stay, right? Yeah. So, that my question then is, which I, 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 it is, how big is your is a microservice? How big is it? 
Yeah, yeah, that's a good question. Can I answer that? Yeah, I'm actually working on a microservices system now. Yeah. Yeah. Now, my background is I've worked on event in uh, CQR systems for quite some time. Yeah. But this is the first one that's actually used the moniker microservices. And what we've ended up with is, you know, everybody knows the repository pattern. Yeah. We've ended up with the microservices repository pattern. Well, we have a microservice for every table. Now, and that table sits on its own database. And we have... Well, that's wrong. Uh, well, exactly. You <laughs> 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 don't do that. It's, it's about building the bounded context. Yes, exactly. But, you know, this is my point. Actually. Now, I, I haven't actually developed it, so let's just... Let's that's okay. Hi, <laughs> 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 everybody. I'm talking for a friend. Yeah, talking for a friend. Everybody. No. Now, this guy will know this, because I've used to be debating about microservices for a while before. It's anyway. So what, what they've ended up with... They've, they've, they broke it down to every basic table to a microservice. And then some PMs come along and said, we need this, this, this to do this domain. Yeah, right? So they've gone, how do we connect these up? Well, we'll stick a web API on that one, we'll stick a message on that, we'll stick a bus on that. That'll do it. And we've ended up with a system that does logging and registration with, can you help me how many services do we have? Uh, about eight. About eight. And yeah. they're intertwined like the worst this drunken spider's web you've ever seen. That's why it goes what you're saying. It's just yeah. so we we're all making know, a distributed know, problem. Yeah. So we all know there's no yeah. pattern to this. Yeah. We all know, we're all learning. But they both have people, you know, they see it, they try and break it down based on other patterns. And you end it up with this thing. Now, when, you, when you've only got this such a simple problem, it's become like this spaghetti junction of a monster. We have mobile tying into this. We have web, web guys tying into this. And they're having to do multiple calls to get a lock in. <laughs> well, they, 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 I think that turns into I think two problems. No, two, two problems here. I think one is one is one is that uh, I think Simon Bryan who said that if, if we can't if we can't create well structured complex, why the hell do we think we can create well structured uh, microservices like based on architectures? And the other thing is that the, another quite a thing was from Liz Keo about where the developers were attracted to complexity like moths to a flame. And if we don't find it, we create it. Now, I think this is part of the, the thing with microservices, is, is, you know, is bringing in, as you say, different technologies. Hey, great, we can write every microservice in a different technology. Why the hell do you want to do that? Who's, who's going to create the people who can maintain this yeah. on a basis? Is there an argument to say that, that what, we're, what we've actually just done is take an object oriented approach to the problem? Yeah. 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 Microservices. We're taking encapsulation and we're saying, oh well, let's just let's just call them microservices. If yeah. yeah. only that were true. What a wonderful world that. <laughs> because there used to be a technology that let you build um, arbitrarily complex systems out of little things that did one thing well, and they communicated with each other by sending messages, and each of them kept a little bit of state hidden to itself. And you could spread them around the, the, the network and they could chat to each other and that was all so transparent. And there were clever ways of making them have a long life, perhaps across process boundaries, uh, which was called Corpa. Erlang. Erlang is another good example of that sort of thing. Small, small talk. talk. Yep. So we had small talk that did this extremely well, but on the assumption that you had one process running on one machine. We've got Erlang that does this extremely well on the assumption that you have many processes running on many machines. Who here has been paid money to write small talk? Who here has been paid money to write Erlang? I'm just gonna lie. <laughs> yeah. in, 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 in the dream world, that's what we think. Okay. The technology exists to do this kind of stuff right, but nobody wants to use them. What we want to do is tie it back with Corba, Ah, oh, dear. Those are the days. Yeah. Cool, so, all that sort of yeah. nonsense. Uh, as I recall, a, well, nobody ever really knew what a service was. Like, nobody ever really knew what a component was, but everybody built service oriented architectures and everybody built component based um, yeah. system, platform, yeah. system, yeah. and framework. But, the, but this is yeah, the problem, yeah. isn't it? Isn't it essentially that, that we've, we've, had, we've had ways of partitioning systems? We've had components, we've had objects, and so on. And people generally use them pretty poorly. Yes. And I think this, this is this is the, 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 so taking that to another level and distributing it's everything. Just I, I, I agree with it. I think you've got you've got three things. You've got this. You need discipline in a team to, to, to deal with any problem. You need experience in that team yes. to not argue over technologies, argue over the actual problem you're trying to solve. Yeah. And I think uh, in, 
you know, if you haven't got that, you know, you're not gonna, you're not gonna, you're not gonna build a good monolith, and you're not gonna build a good distributed system. At any time. you're not gonna build a good system. Full stop. I've heard it said a lot about microservices that in order to be able to actually build an, a, a good, well-designed, efficient service that system that's based on microservices, then you need a mature team. Yes. That is that that, that 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 knows what they're doing and is very talented and all the rest of it. And that that sounds great, but I mean, e even if you had that team, given the the level of turnover that there is in IT and the level of movement there is, and you know the theory that um, every time somebody leaves a team, you get a new team and you have to start again. Then is, does does that mean that what we're really saying is that microservices is actually too hard? Because well, it sounds like well, that's what everybody here is saying. So I, I would suggest that I would suggest that microservices are too hard because everything is too hard. And what you described there is the the necessary but not sufficient conditions for the success of a system construction enterprise using microservices. Well, well that's true for any value of microservices. You need an experienced, capable team who are focused on the problem in hand. And and if you have that. It doesn't really matter what the technology choices are. We're, we're sort of, you know, we're, the, we're, we're technologists, and, and Liz Koff is right that we're attracted to complexity because that's fun and exciting. Fingers on that, aren't we? Um, but without, without necessarily doing the due diligence to get confidence out of it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and the third one, which I didn't mention, is actually knowing your domain. Yeah. Yeah. You know, the last thing you want to do is you've got you've got eight in the microservices, ten microservices, yeah. and a PM comes along and says, you know what we've done, there's absolutely bollocks. Uh, we need you to do this, that, and the other. Yeah, you refactor in that. It's a nightmare. It's completely but, but this is this is why the the, 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 the argument about um, whether you should start from a monolith. It's yes. basically, basically build the monolith and, and, and then carve it up once yeah. you know. Because you know your demand. Well, there used to be a. Uh, <laughs> 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 I'll let me by myself. Uh, there used to be uh, 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 a. Uh, 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 a saying that has fallen out of fallen out of use. I haven't heard it recently, anyway, but I, I think it's it's very true. That um, every every complex working system grew out of a simple working system. But again, we don't we don't in the industry tend to, to maintain that evolution towards a more complex system. We are just going to go you know, full bore, maximum complexity, turn it up to eleven on day one, throw in everything we can think of. And the end result is on how to use it. Um, when I was sitting in the back there, I, I looked up the um, the earliest reference to microservices. And I, originally, it was micro web services. And the definition that was presented was a, um, a a bit of computing resource that does some work for you that's on the end of a URI. Full stop. That's all it is. How long ago was that? That was about <coughs> 10 years ago. Because I don't think there's anything really that new about the idea of microservices. Because I remember back in the 80s, IBM coming in and telling us about this amazing system they have for, for coupling together small pieces of functionality with messages and that kind of thing, which is MQ series, if you heard of that. And it's exactly the same thing, and that was 30 years ago now. So. Yes, maybe so I think is that new. Oh, none of it's new. Um, small talk systems were built this way in the early 70s. Mm. Uh, none of it's new. We just go around and around. One of the, the things that you know, dismays me about um, the industry sometimes is that we, you know, we, we we travel a very long, long route to cover a very short distance. And then we think we've been clever. Yeah. And then we do it again. And sometimes we travel a very long route to go backwards slightly. I think we've been even cleverer. And uh, uh, I think we're always reinventing things, isn't that certainly true? Every time you see, see something, you think that's brilliant, you look at it, you think, well, it's a bit like something I used. Top five, ten years ago, yeah. absolutely right. Yeah. So, going back to moving from monolith to microservices, mm -hmm. the, uh, the the concept of what micro, how, how small is a microservice versus how large is a, is a, micro, uh, a platform we've been building recently is um, uh, we've, we've been deploying the, the idea of the bounding context with uh, an event driven architecture between them, um, uh, employing um, CQRS within the so let's see, we've got three commands separate. Um, I guess I'm not 100% sure whether or not they, they're becoming, the bounding context themselves are becoming monoliths, and uh, actually within them uh, we should be trying to move more towards microservices. But I see there might be actually a number of prerequisites to even achieve microservices in that you have to be able to uh, cheapen 
the, the cost of deploying the service or creating the service in, in, in the first instance, which I don't think we're particularly great at, although we have been achieving it in as we go along. And, um, but at least starting with a se semi monolith, I, I'd imagine, um, is at least ensured, um, at least getting the data in the right places. Um, and microservices, I think, we're seeing actually a pop up in between them with the venture uh, and architecture. Uh, so, so a small app has a single job to do between our bounded contexts. Um, I don't really know what point I'm making with this, but it's more about you know, how small really should we be going with this. And I'm not going to take job with micro microservices, how small is small at all? Is it small so enough or are we at the right level? It's hard to yeah, judge. Yeah, what, what figure of merit that has nothing to do with microservices would tell you whether or not you've come back right? That's a good point. Um, it's, it's quite an easy one, I think. It just, just it does work. Do, are we able to change what we not? I'm not exactly sure. You know, we've got, uh, you know, even with the boundary context that we've got and the services we've got, you know, there's this uh, an amount of uh, data flow between mm -hmm. uh, the distributedness of the, of the architecture is uh, sometimes troublesome for, for uh, some of the developers to grasp and to ensure that when, when they do something over here, as it flows through, it causes an issue over here, mm -hmm. uh, which is obviously a negative. So I always feel like there's a few people worry about how small microservice can be. So a microservice does a job and that's it in the, the day. So it's it's an object which does something, it can be but it can be bigger than you think. It doesn't have to be like this tiny little bit. It just needs to operate on a small scale. So if a microservice seems a bit bloated, it may be the right function. You just can't worry about it too much if that's where it's done. It has to do a single function, it doesn't, it doesn't need to spread out across loads because it seems big, it can be Fairly large, it's just a stack. It's not like a huge amount of different things. It's one thing doing one function, that's it in the day. Yeah, I think it's an area of concern, isn't it? Rather than, I think if you're just quite doing literally one thing, not to leave. If you've got it, uh, oh, lost my train of uh, I think, I think uh, uh, where we, we've got our application yeah. ones, which is described as microservices, but it's not really. It's like an area which is. Which is what one piece of functionality like a customer, and that exposes several actual services, which are all to do with the customer, and that's got its own time set of tables inside the database. We don't have a database, obviously, we've got a shared database, but the customer service just handles the customer tables and then handles out uh, services for everything else. So it's also somewhere in between a monolith and a, a microservice, I think, and that seems to work quite well for us. Someone I was thinking about as we were talking. As you, you were all talking about different areas, I've seen microservices coming about because things have gone from small to big to monolithic, and then teams growing because those monolithic things are really big, mm. but also there's loads of things that the business people want to do, which is great. We want to deliver stuff to business people, but those monolithic things become a bit too big to manage one big monolithic thing, oh I've committed that, oh that's broken this, so you know, and all the you know, so then we start thinking, all right, we'll slice things up. And we start slicing things up almost because it's about your dependencies. Because the teams have become too big, because people have started tripping over each other. Because mm -hmm. if you if you only had one guy maintaining a monolithic thing, you'd maintain that one monolithic thing and there would be no problems. Apart from obviously there's only one guy and he's got lots to do. So we give them a friend to help him, and another friend, and then they fall out, and then another friend. <laughs> but it, that's I always get feel like into dependencies with releasing something. You know, you can't because it's all part of one thing. Oh, that's a shame. You want to yeah. go, and that's yeah. It's another attraction. The mind. I'm wondering if it's a people thing rather than a software or even an architecture or anything like that. It, is yeah. it actually? But then, it's an architecture, but it's the, the, the driver is. Is it to do with releasing uh, different uh, parts of these subsystems uh, being more um, flexible in that way? So if you have one monolithic system that could be released quickly and reliably, we wouldn't really have that problem. I'm going to call bollocks again, I'm afraid. In the sense that if you've got a monolithic system, 
and people are tripping over each other when they're trying to implement functionality. Why is it going to be any different if you split those into microservices? If you take that design and then split it out, there's still going to be a bunch of things that are going to need doing across a whole bunch of different components. Yeah, because in order to, to because, get because by doing it, you've got two build pipelines instead of one. That's what people think and think it's better. Well, so then you've got to focus on the contract. So you've got to say, yeah. okay, you're then going to negotiate on the contract for that service. It's going to have to change. There's a change that's going to ripple through the system in order to, to make that functionality. And this is where I think that there's, there's a bit of a danger. There's, there's, definitely, there's definitely a danger there. I mean, you can get, you can do certain things where it's contract agnostic in the sense that you use messaging and you can, you know, it, but the what, what, what specific to change over here doesn't really affect the. Uh, you know, the other side of it. No, the function, the functionality is going to going to change. You know, the, the chances are that the message will change. Otherwise, you know, you, you, make, you can't make the same call. Yeah, yeah you just it's, it's, it's complexity. Yeah, yeah. So for me, that's that's the implementation details. For when I look at the software mm -hmm. requirements or what client want, what are the pain points in the monolithic system, mm -hmm. which hurting us, mm -hmm. and how this architectural pattern we're trying to use to gain advantage. And I think the most fundamental thing we all developers forget is the cost, return on investment. Someone is paying for that. Yeah. And if we are um, jumping on a bandwagon and saying, oh yeah, we're gonna have a microservices and we're gonna implement that, <laughs> what are the consequences? Mm. Are we geared up to um, maintain the system? Or is that going to be 150 services flying around everywhere and everyone running like a monkey and find out what's actually happened? Yeah. So I think some basic fundamental things need to be done before we jump onto this. Um, yes, these architectural patterns are good to solve a problem, but they are for a specific problem. Yeah, for example, the bound date context has been mentioned loads of time. So we know that domain driven language or domain driven design you can only use in a very complex systems. Now, if I'm writing a simple CRUD system, and I say mm -hmm. I want to write a domain-driven design in it, mm -hmm. it's no, I can't justify that, because the cost is a high. The analysis of the bounded context and the domain is very, very expensive. Then the implementation, then the de uh, de deployments, and all these things I think we often forget. Well, this and we get too busy in, in, in oh, walk into, walk into yeah. Do that. <laughs> yeah. But, then, but this, is, this is why the whole the whole thing about the, 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 the drivers, you know, if you look at where this came from, uh, the, 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 the organizations like Netflix, for example, where they're working on industrial scale. <coughs> and they, you know, all these things that people talk about, you know, using your, your servers like herd animals and all this sort of stuff, is great if you're at their scale, you've got to do those sort of things to survive. That's why they ended up doing them. Whereas, it's no point in, as you say, in, in small applications, trying to pick up on all these things that are needed for, for, for industrial strength stuff. If you like sort of build, you know, building a model plane to the same degree as you would do for commercial airliner, it's like, why the hell would you do that? You know, the, 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 but unfortunately, because it's software, it appears we can do that because <coughs> nobody challenges. So, um, sorry, go on. The main thing, something that, uh, some, <coughs> We all have learned, we all, we've all learned from our experience of working in different places and so on, and something that the hours have carried with me is simplicity. Mm -hmm. So, micro, it's, you know, like you said, very very expensive. It's not just expensive, but it's, you know, DDD, uh, business objects, microservices, you name it, put a name architecture partner or whatever, it's built to solve a specific problem. You look at, you look industry leads, uh, leads like Martin Fowl uh, or King Beck talking about TDD, talking about uh, microservices and everything else. They they are working in huge projects and they are watching very high, highly sk skilled people working in really complex problems where these things actually have a home that actually they're solving a problem that it's needed for. And you may say so like microservices are great. 18 months later, Martin Fowler comes in and says, actually, uh, they, they're great, but your problem, you need to be this tall, and your problem needs to be this big for it. Exactly. And, <clears throat> but we all, we all 
tried to change things like the mothballs. We uh, listen to all these wonderful things and we want to try it out. We want to play with it. So we will write our golf course uh, for my for my cousin. He's got he owns a golf course and I'm going to do it the booking but, 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 system. But this, with. But, but this is just a less <laughs> explicit experiment by your organisation yeah. to, to explore it. It's dereliction of duty it from, is, the, it from is the consultant developers. I, I put, I, if, for example, there's. I tend not to agree, uh, not to agree to it anyway, but I, what I'm trying to say, well, I don't want to go into my rant, but... Uh, <laughs> oh, I, go on, go on. Uh, okay. uh, I wrote, actually, I wrote a blog post a long time ago about if, if Picasso was a software developer. Mm -hmm. uh, I think Picasso would have been great at software development nowadays. He would be earning a lot of money. He would be making so much money, maintenance work he would have to do. <laughs> and I think all of us have a little Picasso in ourselves. We have, we are, we're not only just Picasso, we are attracted to the shiny things. And not, it's not our fault, okay? It, it's, sometimes it is, we just know, it's, we don't know better. We have industry leads telling you all these wonderful things you can be doing, and people in your business often let you do, not, they don't understand the problem that you're working on, or it's like they don't understand IT, or they don't understand the software, the software yeah. delivery, but, but and you are, but, but this is the thing, they're, they're relying on us, they're relying on us as yeah. software professionals to actually make the right, make good decisions for their business context, exactly. which includes the amount of money they can afford, the number of people they have, the technology, exactly. the, the skills those people have, the capabilities of those people, all those things should feature, uh, form part of the context of if somebody says to us, right, now I want to design this, you know, give me a system that does X, then we've got to take all those things into account yeah. rather than just picking out as you say, the, the, the shiny thing. But that's where you pay good money for the good developers that actually deliver and projects where it's successful and they're early or they're etc. It's like now when the architects keep changing their mind. I agree. <laughs> <laughs> that's a jibber me. <laughs> <laughs> but they do. But they do. But take, but take what's happened where we where we yeah. were. One week we're we're all writing everything in .NET. A couple of weeks later, someone's read a blog post that Node's dead shiny. Yeah. That we yeah. should use Node. So we, and everybody we're now, jumped, we're, we're a lot of people jumped in, uh, everybody jumped at the bundle line and let's use Node. A couple of weeks later, no, Java's now a cool, cool thing. Oh, Java's still a cool thing. Because that was a cool exactly. thing. Exactly. But no, now it's, now it's Java. Oh, now it's Kafka. Now it's something else, something else, something else. Yeah, the guys is. that keep saying that haven't written a single line of code of it. Wow. Well, <laughs> this isn't just so good. I think some people keep saying, oh yeah, change this, change this. And the, the names you've, you've quoted, you know, the Martin Fowles and whatever, yeah. Sometimes they don't get their hands fully dirty, they just do they a don't. lot of. No, but to be fair, to be fair, Martin Fowler, if you read his blog posts around, he does around say, Microsoft, yeah, he, does he does say, say we're not going to know how this works until the, uh, uh, you know, until a few years when we see how they bed it in, see how they operate, see how they operate. And thing. also, <laughs> the fact about different, the, 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 the initial serials he said, and I don't know about this sort of thing he said, was about the fact that it's, all, it's ordinary developers, average developers. So at the moment, a lot of the microservice systems, have been built by uh, the initial white citizens and are built by the the, the, um, the more capable people because they're the ones who are in the middle of Netflix trying to make sure the whole thing doesn't fall over. When you once you've actually had some systems built by average developers in a microservice style, but then you've got to compare them against the equivalent of, like, of, 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 a, of a monolith built by average developers in a microservice style. Only then could you really say, is oh yeah, this is, this is exactly better value. in that given context, but. Mm -hmm. You know the, the the whole thing about um, trying to trying to pick this up and, and use you know these people throwing this stuff out. It's like well, uh, you know you should use this it's because Martin Fowler says you should use it. It's, 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 it's a small print. Yeah, people people they don't want to read the small they, print they, in the article. They want to try it. I think some some of the fault lies with the developers as well. And I admit we are really damn good at constructing a very complex problems for ourselves. Mm -hmm. um, I'll give you an example. We don't push back. Some, some of the requirements when come in, we're just too busy finding the solution rather than start taking a step back and saying, hang on a second, what's the probability? So I'll give you an example. We're working on a Vodafone system, very complex uh, feeds, feeds coming in, changes happening on the main mainframe, uh, whatever business platforms they have, <coughs> and the changes happening in R. So someone came in, hang on a second, <coughs> if customer changes address on a main building platform and changes address on our system, so which address are we going to use? And start back, hang on a second, 
what's the probability of this? Um, maybe one in thousand, right? So yeah. do you spend three weeks working on this to s solve this problem while you can do a lot of other things? So sometimes we have to push That's back and say, hang on a second, think about it. That might not be feature you know it required. But quite often the answer is yes, because that's an interesting, tricky problem, as opposed to just doing more crud shoveling back and forth to the database. No. <laughs> that's you a need some thing. microservices, man, with you. <laughs> application databases, that's why you need. No, um, you didn't work for a Vodafone, so you might not know anything about a uh, <laughs> complex problem they have. Uh, event bus. Uh, uh, we had an event bus uh, that was this based on a CQR system, and we did not get access to them for security reasons and data access problems, laws, European laws and whatever. Anyway, that's a different uh, thing. So, so before we uh, go uh, too far away from sort of Microsoft and the Microsoft Office, we have to talk about uh, the deployment and configuration problems that you might, you might run into in the Microsoft Office. Well, interestingly, for me, it's testing. If, if you have a bunch of microservices, and you, you, so you have a, num a significant number of services, say more than five or six, that you're going to plug together, you then got the question of how are you going to test it? So are you going to, to, uh, to test it in a traditional test type environment, an integration test environment, this sort of thing before you go into production? Or are you going to flip yourself, invert yourself, and say, basically, we'll monitor what goes in the production, we'll deploy the services individually, and if the alarm bells start going off and plaxons and so on, then we, we wind that, that service back out and, uh, and try again when we work out what the hell went wrong. Well, there's a different, depending on how the architectural pattern is implemented. Um, some clever tricks you can use, for example, um, let's say if two services are not talking directly, they're talking through a RabbitMQ or any messaging platform. Um, you can see, you can have a clever, um, Lo um, what you call a monitoring system to say how many messages gone on and how many came out. Um, that's a that's another uh, something, and you can have um, actual self healing um, systems if rather than blowing up and say Psh, I'm I'm down I'm down I'm down. What's the compensation yeah. for it? Which, so, be, which is fine, but then, then it means that everybody who's building those microservices needs to be very aware of how to build a resilient service that can deal with the fact that some or all of the things he needs to do to work, to, to work, maybe down, and what it does. <coughs> it comes down. Of it, it comes down to everybody doing their job properly. <laughs> <laughs> and if you do your job right, <laughs> well, I mean, I know, I'm, I know I'm really generalizing here. Uh, I think. If you're doing a lot of services, if, you know, if, you know, I don't. Our problem where we work is not very big. It really is, and we go like a handful of services in there. A big monolith piece of crap over here that we're trying to make it go away. Um, but the one thing that we still don't have is, I think, you can't just you can't just kind of separate in the middle. Uh, you can't just do the middle and forget to do the things that that underneath it, like if you something that we do is uh, rates, uh, the cost, of pro the, the rates for specific products that we have. Previously, they were sitting in the monolith database and we have, we can create as many freaking layers here that deals with rates and they're all microservices and everything else, but when it comes to testing, mm -hmm. somebody can make a change here that mess around the data here and then suddenly breaks something over there and you go and put it live and you go, oh shit, it's not working, why not, because of that. And there was some data that we didn't have on our test database, and oh shit, okay. Yeah. So if you're gonna do. So the thing I've. You seen. have to go application. You have to. You have to kind of vertical slice almost. Otherwise, you get your you testing as well. In a sense, in a sense that you have to. You have to. I don't know. So <laughs> in, in the question, I don't. I've seen is on the testing bit, it's almost who owns it. Uh, Who owns like the, the contract? So, if you if you make a service well, the, of, of what comes in and out of the of the service, so say it's a restful microservice, sure, there's, yeah. there's uh, a call that you make and you get some data out of it. Mm -hmm. So the first the first client for that is almost you, who defines that interface. Yeah. Well, then there's a second client for it who wants something different. 
But then that might break that up, but then that doesn't match. That's where you need. So then the guy in the middle, the actual service, yeah. do they own it? Do they own it? That's where we've had a lot of problems. It's so, for example, the team that I was working before, prior for me going to the bad side and forgetting to code, uh, we had the problem. You know, yeah. even the, the last week you came out, you know, the, the, the team that you're working on asked, we need the new feature in there. And I said, absolutely, it should be there. And it was being done there. But I had so many times people coming in and saying, we want to do some crazy thing that semantically has nothing to do with your service, but we believe this should come from it because we consume your service and uh, it's the best place for it. And you go, no, it's not. And then you have to hear, they have a very year long fucking discussion and argument say, no, it's not going to go there. I'm never going to do this. You have to go and do someone else. It's your problem, not mine. You just, it, this is about potatoes, not potatoes with alarm clocks. In it. Okay. <laughs> no, something I want to talk about the cost of microservices. So we spoke a lot about how developers like to go to the bright and shiny, and Nas has talked about cost. And there is a massive cost overhead when you take the um, monolith X to a monolith, and you say, right, we're going to cut this little microservice out. And some of the costs, at least around infrastructure, are well, for every microservice you, you, you uh, use a Microsoft word, for every microservice you stand up, don't ever say stand up. For every Microsoft, uh, for every microservice you stand it. up, don't ever use that. Um, you're going to have to put a watchdog next to it to make sure it's there. You need to address uh, potential issues with concurrency because now there might be multiple versions. We come down. You them. also need to. Um, you also need to account for the fact that now you, you, you've moved into the network uh, layer, and and actually internet network issues could prohibit your system from functioning in its optimum thing. There's a lot of costs incurred, yeah. and then monitoring in in. Yeah, but if you can't afford it, why would you do it? But, but no, it goes and back to it. it goes back to the problem you're trying to solve. So when you're yeah. trying to solve a problem, what are the pain points? And when you look at the cap theorem, and you say consistency, a, a partitionability, and availability, you only can pick two of them, right? So if you pick partitionability and um, availability, so you're going to suffer on consistency. So the, your system is going to be eventually consistent. Right? So when you deploy the eventually consistent system, the developers who are writing the system have to understand how the eventual consistency works. Yeah, right? And the person who's, the infrastructure is available for deployment, that has to be geared up, up for eventually consistency. If they all microservices are bundled up because the client can't afford 10 different servers and all end up in one server, was the pro problem we're trying to solve? I mean, it comes down to. I mean, I'm going back to the point about uh, the kind of deployment and testing and everything on Microsoft. It really is. It's like you know, don't jump the bandwagon I mean, if you can't. You yeah, can't there, dance. there must be so, good solid reasons for cost benefit, you know, and and um, the support should be available there to provide the required infrastructure. And and James, one of the thing mentioned is about testing. Now, if there are different systems independently working and they need independent testing, but what making sure when so they come together, testing yeah, what, when they come together and they work, what making sure at what level that they are and what's the cost for that as well? I and mean, yeah, it's, it's, it, 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 depending on what you're building and it's how, how complex the problem so is. You're saying about the cost of uh, I don't do it if you can't afford it, but I think there's a number of prerequisites that you need to do to achieve microservices to be able to achieve them and cost them nothing. Well, they, one, one, one of the arguments that you just said was, you know, someone trying to put a clock in a potato, you know, it shouldn't be there, so, so why are you putting it there? And one of the arguments as to why they would be wanting to put it there is because it's too costly to put it somewhere else. It could it's be. too costly to stand up a new service, put the data in there. And I've seen that time and time again. Often the time when, I, when somebody wants to put a clock on my yeah. potato is that they just, for instance, the specifics, this is not the potatoes in here, the, 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 forgetting the abstract, the specific problem is something that specific part of the business went, shed, shed all the money to get some third party company to come out with a huge index of ID to ID, and they said, we need to, every time you return, we don't want 404s anymore from your REST or interface. That doesn't work with us. In fact, I want you, when I ask for a potato, I want, a, I want an apple. 
because if the potato doesn't exist, I would like the apple. Uh, and I, I, and it's just like, but you know, this service says it's not. It, it, it really isn't for what they wanted to do. They, the, this specific part of the team, they want to do personalization on a website. It doesn't live within the, the layer where this application is. It's, it's set with much higher so in the So that's the understanding of, of the, the differentiation. What they're trying the to solve, yeah. yeah. I mean, yeah, they can't. So, so I, I know we've got one type of service and we've got another type of service, but we have a view where you can see all the services. It might not like even be a service. It might be part of a different app. Uh, by service, I mean the yeah, actual I understand, uh, yeah. physical service. But, okay. Uh, yeah, you want you 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 got mid list services, but generally you want to get which one, which yeah. one you want to get. Exactly. And, and we don't have that in a micro service. We have that in one service. Both services live in the same. Mm -hmm. uh, so. Talking about deployment again and integration. Imagine your monolith is a sphere, and think about the, you, you want to calculate the volume and the surface area of the sphere. If you if you decide that you're going to split that sphere into several smaller spheres, the volume will stay the same, but the surface area is massively increased. Yeah. And, and the integration and the deployment comes with the interaction between those surface areas. And that's, that's what worries me, is that, is that by, by, by creating several smaller objects, you, you've increased the surface area. And in my experience, the pain always comes in development from crossing boundaries, from integrating between two separate objects, from deploying two separate objects and, and, and making it. And, and that's something that somebody said earlier, so that if you've, you know, we've had problems this week at Labour Rooms where, the, the, you know, there have been problems in life that were difficult to diagnose. And we were having to try and work out how several different components were interacting with each other and which one might be causing the problem. The symptoms were seen in several different, um, you know, objects, components, whatever. They, with, with microservices, I can see how with unit testing you can say, okay, we're going to test this one service in isolation. But then when you start to integrate and you start to have acceptance tests that are going to be touching several different services that are not necessarily integrating or, or in, interacting in a straight line from top to bottom. They might be going kind of all over the place. And you're trying to say, you know, I, 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 I as an end user am expecting something. Um, but if I don't get that something, whose fault is it? You know, if yeah. all these different things, and that 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 really worries me. And, I, and so, what I want to know is what uh, at what point do you say it's worth that pain? Uh, what are the benefits that you get that make that pain worth it? <laughs> <laughs> that that again. Bring an analogy, by the way, of the subject. Yeah, I agree. Um, the, it goes back to the problem um, we have in, in hand. Um, and if we think carefully and look at the actual problem, most problems have a solution in it itself. You just need to find it. Um, and the, if, if those services are not uh, behaving as they should or the expect, acceptance, uh, expectation is not met, um, obviously, one of them is on a fault, or maybe both of them on a fault. What is the compensation? Some operation has been performed and it's gone wrong. How is it going to compensate for that? Right? So, um, the way I look at uh, when eventually systems work, um, when I look at microservices, I look at eventual consistency. So, the problem, I, I always give an example when. You go to ATM machine and you withdraw 20 pound, and bank says, oh, I won't go any 20 pound. Next, give you card back. When you look at your statement, they take the 20 pound out, then they deposit it back in. Check in next time. Anyone who's ever done it. So how their system withdraw the money, 20 pound, to give it to you, but then they thought, hang on a second, the ATM does not have a 20 pound. So the system itself, compensate itself and says, you know what, I need to deposit that 20 bar back for it. So we need to write, we need to be clever about these things when we jump onto microservices and say, yes, something gonna go wrong and it's gonna go wrong, but when it goes wrong, how I'm gonna compensate. Yeah, so if you've got compensation in, the, in each part, you will get the problem further downstream. So if that is what comes back to what you say, if everyone's doing the job correctly, Everyone's being fault tolerant, thinking about all these exceptional cases. 
you're not going to get these, or you're going to get much less uh, problems uh, further downstream. So, yeah, so <laughs> stay there, man. Stay, <laughs> come back, come back. So, so, so just with the surface area analogy, because I think it's pretty good, is that the surface area is increased at reducing the cost. You mentioned two two areas, which is where the increased cost comes in. We've been talking about the integration between many things. The surface area, I think, can, can be reduced if you work out um, improving the way that you deliver the software to cheapen it to be more predictable and the same Even. patterns introduced over and over again. So, um, Paul will know, if you ask the actor, especially a specific one, you probably know who I'm talking about, he will say, uh, how do you chip in the scene? We need an API team. He will say, we no, need an API know. team who <laughs> deals with the API. <laughs> no, you no, just, just need to re repeat yeah. the same patterns yeah. and, and automation. Repeat, yeah, you have, you have to be yourself. diligent, you have to do, you have to um, be a... The other cost which I've seen greatly on, on, on our teams is uh, the, the, the cost with the integration is, is that um, similarly it doesn't understand when they do something over here it causes a shitstorm over here. And, um, in some case you make a mistake on how yeah. you're separating your microservices that you, you're exposing yourself to even more integration models and more issues on development that you wouldn't otherwise had you made it just slightly bigger or slightly more or even not have created it at all. Yeah, so, you know? so the idea of that then is I think is to reduce the distance between the two, the two points and um, I think I think that's where communication between context. <laughs> I think that's need to go. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that, that's, that's where the communication between the and context really plays into patterns, you know, so and um, you say about payback is well if there is no payback then what's the work? What what should you be doing? Can your systems what do your systems do? Did you just lose a message and then and five weeks later somebody realized realize something didn't happen? Mm. Or or you know, um, a lot of message queues now have dead letters don't they? They have that on purpose so you can alert off them and go, oh, shit, something's gone wrong. Yeah. You know, and um, that sure. that then reduces hopefully the distance between the source of the problem and, and yeah. the resulting yeah, further down. Yeah. So I think this this conversation goes to the heart of what I struggle with. Or perhaps the thing that's at the top of the list of things that I struggle with in this area. Um, if we if we go back to that that idea that of, of a a micro web service mm -hmm. is a bit of computational resource that lives on a URI. URI not URL, by the way. Yes. Um, it lives on a URI and it could do something for you. And what is the nature of the web? The web, um, I know some of you work for places that have .com in the name, and I'm maybe going to find this a little bit upsetting, but the, <laughs> the web is for things that don't matter very much. I love making money out <laughs> The web is for stuff where if you tried it and it didn't work, that's okay. The web is for things where the cost of failure is very low, and the cost of retries is very low, and eventual consistency could mean sometime next year, and that will be okay. It boggles my mind that people are taking a, um, a technology which was invented to make it easier to share scientific papers. That is a... I can't remember exactly where it falls in the in the ISO five level, but it's towards the top. It's like an application protocol. It's the hypertext. Tra What's the, the native language of the web? Is the hypertext transfer protocol? Hypertext transfer, not the bank account changing protocol. And banks have the protocols for doing that, and they're really hard and they're really complicated. These work with Swift. It's an unspeakable nightmare, and it has to be because it has to work. Uh, I've worked with people in, um, oh, I think it was a, a pension, uh, uh, the fund manager attached to a pension company, uh, and I was, we were doing some stuff, they talked to the Swift adapter, and said, so what happens if you can't contact Swift? And the message doesn't go through, they say, well, that's kind of the end of the world. <laughs> so we don't really have to worry about that too much. <laughs> um, the web is not for things like that. And this idea that you've got a, you know, a, te a technological concept that comes out of that world of browsing documents in a non-critical, uh, failure-permissive, non-time-critical 
sort of way. And yes, Ward gave us the magic of wikis and and showed that you could take post um, you could take post seriously and you could take put seriously. Um, still, I think most web servers don't do an honest implementation of delete because uh, that's a little bit too frightening, right? That's a little bit scary that somebody could hit uh, a URL and that a resource is gone. No, uh, we don't, we don't want that. Um, the idea that we're taking that and building mission critical stuff out of it uh, is terrifying. It's absolutely terrifying. And I'm, I'm sure that in, you know, these things go in cycles and, and fashions emerge and they divide. And I'm, I feel confident that sooner rather than later, uh, and it might not be very long, we're going to look back at this whole building. You know, it, it, it's great that you can use the web technologies to do stuff that isn't really documented. And all the plumbing is there for you, and the load balances are there for you, and uh, the filtering and the pipes, and yada yada, and that's all super wonderful. Um, I'm sure we're going to look back at this idea, and, and microservices sort of takes it to its logical conclusion. We look back at this idea that you can take uh, a technology devised for browsing non critical documents now and again and use it, sort of push it down the stack and treat it as, as the foundation for this, this pile of more and more important and mission critical stuff. We can look back at that and think, what did we think we were doing? I completely agree with you. On that point, I really do. No, 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 no seriously. Uh, it's already starting. We got web sockets. I got web sockets that can send binary data between one point and the other and uh, through the web. Uh, why would I want to do that? Point. Yeah, exactly. But we, we've been together, it's like it's a circular thing. It, it, we will get to a point that we're going to go and say, why the fuck are we doing all of this? Why can't I just go back to the S400 days? Actually, that should work. The journaling system on that thing was amazing. It is amazing. It's still running. Many fucking business systems are still being run on it. So the revolution's so, coming. No, the revolution's already happening. Okay? <laughs> it's just below the, below, below the radar. Yeah. But no, I think the point is, is that we have microservices, and like I said, we already we did it before, and you guys mentioned it before. It's like you know, the, the technology they do much better. It's already done, been doing since the seventies, or much earlier than that. We are, the, when somebody asks, and I when some when I used to, I, you know I used to be a cock in my previous job. When people come up to me and say you're a software developer, say no, I'm not. I'm not a software developer. I'm a software engineer. Because there's a difference. We have forgotten. The, a lot of the engineering principles, and we are lit, we are we are <laughs> we are pissing the work of giants that people before us who built things that that you know that worked. They went through this already. We are rediscovering with the wheel every day, especially with web frameworks and the 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 HTTP and everything else. God, it's like I saw what I can connect. Why can't I just open a port and connect? Over TCP/IP, which is a great protocol, and it's got fault tolerance in it, uh, to send you some data. Mm, now you have to send me an HTTP request, which I have to acknowledge, and send you back and say, "Now you can upgrade," and then we can open that socket and transfer some data in probably JSON format because I really don't trust ones and zeros. You know what I mean? Yeah. And it, it, so it comes down to doing the right, you know, knowing what you're doing. So if it's like. You have really comp if you have it's like it, it's quite right pointing out it's like there are there are, there are industries that look at what's going on with the HTML5 revolution with what's going on with the microservices and they're just laughing their head off just like <laughs> we did that like 20 years ago um, yeah. and uh, it pays their bills and their waters and moves seven trillion pounds around the world every second um, yeah they, they will learn from it so they'll come back to us you know. <laughs> I'm not saying that we're doing something wrong. I think, and I, I'm not saying that they. Well, we are. <laughs> well, it is. Yeah, of course, it is. We are. Doing something. We are. We are doing very wrong. But then again, we don't know well enough to know that we are doing it wrong. Just again, before we go too far away from my because you said one thing on the side of my microservice, because it, because again, there are things, you know, I think as you said, there are things that have been built that do all this transactional stuff very, very well already. Yeah. And what we then have to do, if we're going to build it on top of microservices, basically means you need to know all that stuff. 
all that yeah, stuff exactly, that's yeah. taken a lot of very clever people years and years to get into their decades. heads. And yeah, decades. So, you know, the individuals working in one area, you've then got to be capable of doing that. It's oh, and this. It's oh, and this. And doing all this very well. With those, you you want to be making the choice of, do you need that? If you need that, yes. then, then okay. probably you, you might be using that technology. And it's all about the degree of, of what degree of control do you want. You know, with, with, uh, if you're going to do a TCP connection, then, then you, you're probably requiring a lot of control. If you don't require that great deal of control. And it could, it actually comes back to, to a lot of what, what Andy was saying, and, and, and I see a lot of people rushing to do, sorry, I'm going to I will say the words every now and again, just so you know. Microservices. Microservices. I'll just make sure he's in the right level. I see, I see people, for example, you know, setting up um, Hadoop clusters to do all that stuff they do, <laughs> they do clusters, right? And it takes it takes fifteen minutes to spin up a cluster, mm -hmm. and yes, the, the actual data munging goes like that, and then another fifteen minutes to get it all out again, and that's preposterous. And the reason it's preposterous is that they're using big data tools, and their data is not big. Most of our data is not big. Yeah. Um, if you're Facebook, your data is big. Mm -hmm. If you're Twitter, your data is big. Yeah. If you're Doing um, random stuff on the web.com, your data probably isn't that big. Four terabytes is not big. No, no, it's not. It's not. It's not. It absolutely isn't. Um, uh, That's the size of our database, by the way. Most yeah. of these error logs. Two point two. It is. That's not right. Are we? That's the thing. No. What point? We can make the database the, the, the database much much fa work much faster. We should just look at one one table, so we'll be all right. <laughs> just say you want it to go fast, no problem. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> and it's the same with uh, yeah, you mentioned um, so, Netflix. Hmm. If you're if you're Netflix and you're piping HD movies with five one Dolby to everybody in the world, oh, twenty seven different formats, so, yeah, whatever. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, it's so. <laughs> um, <laughs> <that's great. laughs> um, then you've got a then you've got a problem where this kind of level of architectural sophistication that comes from microservices <laughs> <laughs> might be worth it. But if you're you know if you're but not, it, then you're not. But even you even then, even then, if if a bunch of people don't get the fill that they want to, they don't get you know. Yeah. Whatever, whatever it is, uh, uh, Frozen Two that evening, it may feel like a disaster yes. uh, with small children. It may, but it's not a disaster compared no. to a million dollar trades going no. AWOL, which is why people tend to not use the, the, the people set of technologies who are doing to do the million dollar trades. I'm not using this stuff. Yeah, no, no, yeah, yeah. They absolutely. They'll be crazy. Too. Yeah, they would be. I, yeah. Well, I'd like to say, I completely agree. I mean, one of the arguments I heard, and I've been, I've been pushed at, was microservices help your database. Yeah, we've got a thousand records on our database and it's running like a dog. If we split it into microservices, we can put one table there, one table there, and we get the performance. And that is the truth. Yeah, that actually has been said to me. There's a couple of websites. I know. <laughs> now, there's a company in Manchester, and a lot of people don't know about it, it's called Greater Manchester Police. Uh, my wife happens to work there. Uh, and they work on the police national database. This makes even Facebook look like, you know, a SQL Server instance on, on Azure. They have vast data going back 50 years. They run Oracle clusters that are monster machines, you know, that say queries that take 24 hours to run. They don't need market service. So do we, when we're storing a, an employee and an absence, do we need it? No, not really. We just need to be something simple. We do. It's like it's just simplicity is key. That's something. It's like so I want to rewrite one of uh, each one microservices. I want to rewrite one of our uh, of one of our applications and I thought why? It's like I think it was going to put into RPG, yeah, something that was gonna put in RPG and I thought uh, why am I doing I start doing it in Node.js to ensure in a micro microservice in Node.js. <laughs> I'm sure there's an NPM microservices. If there isn't, I'll coin down. I'll, I'll do it tonight. Um, 
in Express, obviously. No, I don't like Express. I'm doing Connect because, you know, I like to find it instead of my time. Uh, so I was doing it, and then I said, okay, well, I'll stop that. And I decided, instead, I'm just going to write the whole, the whole entire thing in one app. And I did it. It was about that big. Uh, it's a, it was using none, so it's just done anything that big, not, not that difficult. And that was it, it was done. And I was like, that works really well. And it's, it's, it's for that specific problem domain, was a monolith. it was a monolith. It had, it got, it had the database at least three times to get data from disparative places and munge it all together and spat out the format that I wanted. And I say, I. Uh, that's yeah. That's it. My box. My job's done. Why do I need them to? I then the other the other way around was like looking right from the top in Apigee or whatever we have, whoever we gave money to create API microservices APIs. Um, and I would now okay. I have this format that I need to output, but I need to get da data from three different places. So I would start looking and say, well, oh, shit, I'm gonna have to call this service and this service and this service. Dump eighty percent of the data that comes out of this one. Uh, use about one percent of this one and all of it. And when I get the, all the data together, I'm going to have to make a series of group buys and shit all the loops to just output some op annoying XML format that I wanted. And it's like, okay, uh, well, that's, no, I would just build the monolith. I just build that one thing that does a job that I want. And was it. A um, colleague of mine um, uh, in his, his, his other job, um, stripping out, this Steve, uh, stripping out um, big data and stuff uh, from, the, uh, from the publishing house where he, his other job is. Um, where they're, you know, they're, they're, looking, they're looking at, you know, their data set is like um, the title and abstract of every article in every edition of this journal that's been published for the last 300 years, type of stuff. It's getting into the realms of respectively knowledge data. Yeah. And they were going at it with, with the big data tools, and probably also some microservices. <laughs> and he's been taking that out and replacing it. You're lost in that. <laughs> <laughs> replacing it with shell scripts. Yeah. yeah. I can't imagine. Straight up shell scripts. And maybe a little bit of that, that um, the, the GNU parallel mm. to push it out onto multiple machines if you really need that. Yeah. But of course, these days you can you can get a you can get a four U box that's got eight three gigahertz cores in it and a bajillion megabytes of RAM. Yeah, 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 yeah. And you don't really need to, yeah. although you can if you want. And it's just you know scripty scripty pipey pipey T tail get the thing out of the end. Uh, and that, 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 that's really I, I think going back to the point of microservices, and I think we just probably, I think we just keep going on and it. It's a, it, it's, it can be hard. It, I think it's hard when <coughs> you're applying it to the wrong size of problem. Mm -hmm. uh, it's probably very easy, um, obeying the cost of yes. whatever. Maybe, maybe you would get misled by the word, word by the micro. Yeah, it, it, it's. Because it, actually, you're absolutely right that it's the, it's the, it's the plugging it all together and the, and the interfaces where all the complexity goes. And it doesn't disappear, it just gets pushed around and smeared about and becomes difficult to understand and difficult to manage. Yeah, it does. And, and the and hard thing is just as hard as ever it was. Yeah, it's still, it's so if it may be harder, it yeah. will be harder. Well, the, the, yeah. the, essential complexity, the essential complexity of the problem we try to solve is irreducible. Mm -hmm. And then yeah. it's a question of how much accidental complexity we're going to wedge in. Much. And the, the trade-off is, you know, really strongly biased in. in, in it is. It is. Yeah, if, if you've got if you've got a service that takes a customer and all, yeah. If you was writing a monolith, it's it's not even it's a no-brainer. It's stored on the database. It's done. If you've got a right microservice that deals with that, and you've got a right service that watches the service to make sure that the service don't get get out, and the service to monitor the services service. Uh, hang on a minute. <laughs> hang on. How many services are going to monitor your service? You know, are we are we are we sending a space shuttle up with this? Uh, you know, the, the system that monitors the system that monitors the system. If, yes. if a trillion dollars a second is re uh, it's, it's dependent on that service that watches the service, then you better yeah, put of the service. But if, if we're making well, you, would, the you, wouldn't have, you wouldn't have that in the first place, but if you're in a situation, you will put as many as you could. Although, so, so although the, actual, the actual space shuttle has three, and only two of them have to agree. 
Yeah. I mean, but if, so if our service is making a point one of a penny for every transaction, yeah, it's costing us about ten pounds to, to to keep this service running yeah, and to develop this service. That's massive. Ah, you're making a bank on volume. <laughs> <laughs> but it's going back to the point that it is it is great for the right problem and is for the right circumstances. Really, I think the key thing that I hope people will take out of this session today is that it's just you have to you you have to think really hard whether it's what's going to work for you and is we you we're contacted that you know for banking is no good and we'll probably agree banking for banking you wouldn't want to use that. Uh, but Everybody's got different problems. They have different domain problems. They it's comp different, uh, well, a different environment that that Microsoft's actually made it the answer, and it's and do, might do not we know what that, that, what No, we don't. Is, that is the <laughs> no, it's not. We don't. <laughs> well, I, think, I think that's what I'm trying to say. We yeah. we will never know. We can. It's up to everybody. Everybody who is in control of deciding what is what they. That everybody's presented with a problem, they have to think really hard on the solution and make sure that what they have, if, if microservices is the answer, but be, be flipping sure it is the answer because it's going to be expensive. It's going to increase, you know, you have more surface areas, player put, and you, is, you know, is, you're going to have to pour, there will be more money going to operations to ensure that thing is running. Service desk may, you know, you're going to have developers having to worry about message, for message formats and everything. <coughs> I just want to make the point that uh, we've been talking about the increased cost in production of maintaining all these systems, um, but as I'm looking also, there's the cost of even getting it up and running in development. In the old days, you build a monolithic app, monolithic app, a new developer would join the team and they would have one app, say in C Sharp, build it, run it, there you go, it's one big system. We're in the position now, the team I've joined, that uh, we've got a uh, service which has, well, it's, we have six microservices for this one product. Uh, five of them in uh, .NET and one of them is in Node. Yeah. They also rely on an event stream and an OSQL database. And now actually getting all of this up and running when half the team are on PCs and half are on Macs. Don't forget that nightmare. nobody know how to use the NoSQL database. <laughs> and the event, because we, you know, Rabbit is so mainstream and we are, we had, we're hipsters. We want, the, we want the Apache project. We're bigger than Rabbit. Way. We are bigger than rabbit. We are bigger than rabbit. We need, we need the, we need the stuff the big boys play with, mm -hmm. right? It's like, nah. So yes, yeah, so now we've got this position that it's ridiculous even trying to get the thing set up and running on a new machine. It's it difficult to get it working at all. I can echo all that. We, we, uh, Dev the other day, he, he did a change. He did a little microservice, and he said, well, "I just need to just test this." And he said, "Well, I need to install this one, this one." And he ended up with six microservices mm -hmm. running on his laptop. And you go around here. Yeah, still don't know because I didn't start that one because of that one, and there was an in service issue, an in service bus issue, and then it was We've also got the problem with the uh, integration <laughs> tests on this one now because uh, yes, we have the we have the end to end tests because we're all good and have end to end tests, uh, but we've got people working on the different microservices, um, and they make a change of behaviour over here. Excellent, change the test, pass. Someone working on a completely different piece of behavior on a different service on a different machine suddenly gets the latest version of the test and boom. Yeah, we, we had one where we've got the domain and it, uh, the domain objects, they changed. Yeah, some services had this version, some services didn't have that version. They were picking up, that was picking up, why not? Nobody knew. Mm -hmm. So we actually went through looked at every version that was actually there. Oh yeah, there's some worn out. Uh, so we had to compile it to be the player. May I add that? that was long. One of the things that I've seen recurring constantly popping up in this discussion this evening is is the whole you should only use microservices when you're, you're this complex and when you're this tall and what I've been thinking about a lot is um, how much I, I, I believe I now fully understand the true impact of the use of microservices and the decisions that you have to take when choosing that and this may be a little off topic so someone replace me quickly no, just but say microservices for the time. Microservices. <laughs> On topic. But I, one thing that's come home is the principles of XP, the principles of, of what we should be advising people as software professionals and, and emergent design and, and how, like, don't jump to big data just because it's the new call. Don't jump to... Um, don't, 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 don't jump to um, Redis cache 
when you could just hot surf from the database until you need to optimize. You know, don't optimize early. You know, do these things later so it's emergent design. Don't go and microservice the bad boy up and, until you're this complex and you're this high. And I feel that I, I wanted to add that, that I feel everybody that's been part of this discussion that's been involved tonight, that we're all duty bound to be pragmatic and to educate those that we influence um, about the truth of the cost of microservices and such things. At the end of the day, we are the professionals, we're the ones offering the advice. And, and I was kind of blown away by just how much you're really saying when you say to somebody you should use microservices. You know, that comes with a big fat price tag, and I don't know what the co conversion rate is. So I just wanted to kind of put that out there that I think it's a mindfulness that it's a tool in our bag of tools, and it has its uses, but if you're not this high, you're gonna break the system. It's a responsibility, we should have a responsibility to, to a customer or a company you work for, you know, to advise them. Well, you're a cowboy, not you, but just <laughs> yeah. Yeah. one's a cowboy. Yeah. So is it okay? So I've, I've not read enough into Netflix, and I probably should have done. Um, but did they go, they are obviously the poster child for microservices, did they start microservices because their customer base got too big to be able to run in monolithic apps? Did they have to find some way of partitioning it up? I think that's basically what it is. I went to a talk on it a while ago. That's basically what they said. We had this application that worked really well then. It just got too big. Mm -hmm. Couldn't go the performance wasn't good enough, so they thought, how can we do this? So this is split up into microservices simply so that they could scale. Because you can, you can have one microservice serving things, but then as you scale, you have two, three, four, the same thing, doing the same job and scaling times, which you like. That was their big driver for it. So, so the, a couple of points that both of you made was about uh, the cost of you trying to run your app and you've got to talk to like five microservices. Um, I think you kind of have that same problem anyway in, in other instances, like when you're using uh, service on. Or orientated architecture or distributed architecture, similar with bounded context. You know, they, they're not microservices, they can be quite big services. And you still have those integration points. Um, but regardless if you're using uh, microservices or, or larger services, you're still going to always have those problems. And you have to protect your application to, to a point where you can actually run it regardless of those services. So that, that's where your ports and adapters and your trying to create an imperative shell around your application to avoid those issues so you can run it in isolation. At that point you do end up needing to ensure you've got a real good test environment and the right level of integration tests and your end-to-end -end tests as well. Um, but without those you will always have those problems even if you're talking to a monolithic monolithic service yeah. or, or that's, just, that's just good engineering practices. Isn't it? Yeah. yeah. So but then it, 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 goes, it involves then some experience again in the team. Yeah. 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 If you've got an experienced team, you're going to have an excellent model. You're going to have an excellent microservices. You know? yeah. yeah. Have you got your pyramid of tests right? <laughs> <laughs> Doesn't always happen. No. Yeah. How many times have you had lots of tests? Yeah. So, uh, one of the things that came up a lot in the survey uh, at the time was testing. So, I'm wondering if perhaps we could uh, delve into that. What are the right level of uh, end to end tests, integration tests? Um, for microservices, and does that differ from monoliths? I think on paper, microservices are very enticing because it looks like you can test each one in isolation and not give a damn about what's happening in the outside world with the other bits, which is a bit disingenuous. Yeah, because, because nothing uh, ever glues up no. the <laughs> <laughs> Because when things blow up, it's always, when you put them all together, they all look fine individually. And well, the, um, I think one of the one of the things I keep um, reminding myself every morning: uh, a very basic software engineering principle: um, keep it dry, shy, and tell the other guy. And when we look at the system, um, most core bases I've seen, they all violate that. Um, so all I'm going to say is, is be pragmatic. Look at the actual problem and think about carefully what we actually uh, trying to solve. And again, I'm going to repeat that: keep it dry, shy, and tell the other guy. 
if, it, if it's somehow testing a microservice, the, the, the problem I have with the testing a microservice is one of the things we, we, we lose, or one of, the, one, of the, one of the bits of complexity we gain is, is configuration management. So we create potentially, with a lot of services, configuration management nightmare for ourselves in the sense of um, what is our application? What is that set of services? Well, which set of services? Which versions of which services? With which data? Um, so I used to suffer from, from um, a bit. So you know what, what, I'm, what I'm trying to, I'm trying to um, project this onto a bit of my previous experience, which is a large bank um, where we had test environments and we had applications or bits, you know, bits of bits of the applications like mainframe or this sort of thing from different or different um, teams. So this is this in many ways it's like a microservice thing. You know, there are various bits of the mainframe that various different teams on the mainframe maintained, and the test environments would all have different versions of those. Um, so those the mainframe, mainframe subsystems that wouldn't match with what was in production because they were also testing in the test environment and therefore you know actually trying to get hold of something that looked anything like live with a combination of different services that are all served by different teams was a complete nightmare and a lot of it you then have to do, take a risk-based approach and say well they're changing this area so we're probably not going to change this that much and uh, therefore you know we'll cross our fingers we'll roll it out the weekend, and uh, then if it fails, we'll have to roll it back again, and we'll do another three months before we can try again. Something we've had to do, um, we had it set up originally, so there was a CI environment, and uh, yes, each time a service, anyone committed to any of the different services, it would build them all, it would deploy them all, and it would run all the tests against them. Um, which did actually work to a degree, yes. Feedback a bit slow. Hmm? Feedback a bit slow. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, but the real problems then came that uh, this meant that it was a, a bit of a shifting mess for testing, for the actual manual testing, the QA, deciding what actually got released. Uh, and we had to introduce a second layer of um, UAT, where that's fine that there's the CI stuff, but for actually doing a live release, the uh, QA has to pull in manually which service and just one service at a time they want to test and then preferably just release. So only one service changes at a time. But aren't they essentially then just having a soft monolith in yes. the sense of this is the cassette configuration that we're happy with and that's therefore what's going to go out? So, so one, one thing you have to consider is about with microservices, services, does it, because you're talking about those, those issues with having different versions. And I think with Microsoft services, you want to be releasing them as quickly as possible. So if you have a long process between doing a change, confirming it works, and releasing it, if it's too long, you increase the likelihood that it's going to be wrong before you release it because the versions of other Microsoft services. Um, so, so with with that point, really, is it's about um, one one of the prerequisites I think we need to to do with Microsoft services is the ability to release quickly because. In that window, nothing else should have changed, and, and you've confirmed that everything that is in that test is probably live already. You know, that you're the only person who made a change like, 10 minutes later, you've already released. The problem is, it doesn't really work like that in real life, and it often takes far too long. Well, this, 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 this but the then it needs to, I guess, fit in with the culture of the business. Does the business require you to release that quickly as well? But even but the thing is, if you've got a set of teams, I mean, the, the one thing that I think that, that vaguely strikes me as being at all sensible around this is the idea of having people aligned to a particular, you know, partitioning the team. So you're reducing the complexity area, that if somebody's new onto the team and this sort of thing, you reduce the amount of things they've got to deal with rather than there's a whole monolith of stuff and you've just got to deal with any of it. So, the, but the, if you've got a whole set of different teams working, if they're all trying to work that fast and say, you know, we need to keep deploying very rapidly, very regularly, there's no, the, you know, the, you potentially you could have thousands of changes to the to the live system every day because if you've got 10 teams all pushing 100 changes in you know they're, 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 you know they're trying to be really fast and it's, then it, it seems to become impossible to actually pre-test that but there's no way your test can run fast enough to keep up with the fact that oh you know we just about got to the end of the test and bang somebody else has put something in oh right okay let's go back to start the test again and that was it. part of the reason also having the QA manually pull the changes through yeah. the ones in the test um, was when they was just triggered automatically, yes, they'd be halfway through the testing and then something else would trigger it again. Yeah, yeah that's why right. right. okay, who was that? Who was that? The right sensible approach for, for your business, your your department, your size of company, 
your need to be able to how often to deliver it. Oh, I think but they, but this is where it gets into the, the, the question of what so, you know, excuse me saying what, what these technologies are meant for. Mm -hmm. um, so I remember having this thing with the, uh, a few years ago with the Fred saw uh, Fred George from, from um, Forward, I think, is it, uh, the, what they we, we call developer anarchy, where they were just committing all the time directly. And then Unruly Media seemed to, seemed to do this as well. If you look at Rachel Davis's teams and, and their presentations, they seem to commit directly from the developers' machines, which for most organisations, you know, like a large bank, they would, the, the, the risk people would just shut it down. There's they, no more way on earth they would ever allow you to do that. So the, the question with some of these is, is, is you know, the, 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 do they act, you're right, do, do they actually fit your business? Um, because if you, if you are looking to do that, that sort of deployment, the only way you can do, the only way to manage that is to monitor in production and then roll back. But obviously if you're doing that, then there's a question of compensation. Can you actually compensate? Can you actually work out what the hell went wrong? And if there's persistent data and transactional data, unraveling all that, could be a, you know, and then you don't have the tooling to be able to roll back quickly. Correct. So then, so so you just can't work that way if you've got that sort of transaction data. Yeah. I think one of the basic concept is when microservices have a contracts, they have to be well defined contracts, and they should hide the complexity behind those contracts and only expose a well defined interface to whoever the consumer is. And the way I look at the testing uh, microservices, I can repeatedly say, here's my input, give me the output. Because something is going in, something coming out. It's doing something. And I can say to microservice that here's my input and what's my output. And I can, well, in, in our CI environment, we can yep. set up a system to say, okay, fire up so many requests and get the response back and see if the response back is one of those things which we expect. Well, the problem is it's not with the individual service, is it? It's the network effect. It's the fact that it's, if you're saying we want to create a, or you want to try accept services because we've got a complex uh, monolith, we you know, it's too complex, we will make it simpler by cutting into services so we're going to understand some services. The complexity is still there in the overall deployed system. And therefore, if we couldn't understand the monolith because it was too big and complex, we can't really, in the same way, we can't understand the deployed network system because it's too complex. So therefore, even though that bit, we've, you know, we can run the tests against it and it, it yeah. comes back fine, unless we actually understand exactly how all the different potential paths through the system work together, there's no way we can predict what the consequences of the changes made on that will have on anything else. What, what about use of microservices in a very distinct way? Like, if you think about something like Spotify, mm -hmm. where you've got this kind of host application, and then each part of that screen is a, is a different uh, team working behind it. Mm -hmm. And actually, there's a, there's, a, there's a real separation between the, the top left and the top and the bottom right. You know, in, in terms of the team is going through the whole stack, they're doing the front end, they're doing the microservice at the back. They're doing the database, then they can test that, that, that feature from the previous version. And, and you see what I'm saying? You're using microservice in a way that doesn't doesn't talk to another microservice in that sense. Yeah. But, 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 but then again, you're distributing out the system, it's, it's discrete, it's, it's, it's decoupled from the rest. But, of it. but I think there is, a, I can't remember the reference to it, but the, the, I'm sure I read something about Spotify that that was the intention. <laughs> but then what they found was that you know a particular service, a particular thing. Mm. Oh, it's well, we're now introducing this over here, and that therefore is a change the, further the, up. The, the users expect the two things to work together. Ah, right, okay. Yeah, um, and not the oh well, yeah, that bit down there in the bottom right isn't no deadly squat about this new whizzy thing we just introduced from the top <laughs> left. Uh, it'll come at some point downstream. The, 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 that, that got very bad feedback from, from users. Therefore, they found that they did that coupling. You know, they, they, right. they, the coupling came back again yeah. because they had to, to make sure the different bits of the system yeah. worked as a coherent whole for the customers who are feeding to. Right, and then you're back to this conversation. <laughs> well, I'm just an idea. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, some of the things we. Um, we can use is these small tests. Um, every, I think one of the things you know, I've used in the past is every single time when we deploy a complex system, um, run some basic small, small tests on it and see if the system is behaving correctly. And 
I admit there was some manual uh, testing involved after those uh, smoke tests because some of the things could go wrong and the smoke test wasn't capturing those those things. Um, and but, it, but it's all about risk, isn't it? Yeah, it's it is. Yeah, test, testing is all about risk. So, exactly. Which is why for people like Unruly Media, for example, it's a lot less risky than pushing to production because the, 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 their context is they are, they are um, governing which videos people see. When they hit a particular site and you get a little video, those nine video clips that you've got to watch for a certain amount of time and that sort of thing, they're, they're ensuring that the right type of people see the right video clips for them and, give them that, and they're paid by advertisers to make sure it happens. So if, they, if their system goes to shit, um, what will happen is people see the wrong videos. Nobody dies, nobody loses, you know, nobody loses money, they just get some uh, rather annoyed um, customers when there is brought it back to them the fact that their new video for the Volkswagen Golf hasn't been shown to 3,000 users of potential you know, people who are looking to buy a small, you know, small new car. I, I think, the mo yeah, there's one thing about, but the confidence level from the client or the customer drops on the team. Um, and then they start adding constraints that, oh, Friday, Saturday, Sunday is our busy day, so don't you dare touch our production schedule. So that is a very important thing, because when releases go wrong, um, the confidence level in the team and on the client, client side as well, they go down. And only one bad release um, can destroy all of the hard work that the team has put in place to get to that level. And then you start over all over again and trying to say, don't worry, we will release. So it's very frustrating for a developer. But, but that's, that's, that's true regardless of whether you're deploying a monolith or deploying a set of Microsoft. Yeah, so it's, it's, it's goes back to, it's a risky, um, well, we're not killing someone. We're not writing um, software for, well, at least I'm not writing a software for livestock machines <laughs> like we were discussing earlier. Um, if I'm writing a software for a live sports machine, I will probably be sweating a bit more. But equally, um, you will be using, well, again, coming to Keyspot, you will be using these technologies. You wouldn't yeah. be using microservices and HTTP and this sort of thing for no. a live sports machine. Yeah, so. so sorry, <laughs> number four, not four. <laughs> <laughs> is that machine there or a customer? <laughs> yeah. But what, you, what we found is, like, the one thing we found was we use a consumer test, and so what it would be is, like, another API or, like, front end or whatever would consume our API it would set up what it expects to get back, so the test would run, and it would go, all right, I'm gonna send this request, and it would send a response, it would match up, and that's how you would get that like that redundancy between the two systems. So rather than having just one area going, all right, let's test this one stack, there was that communication test, and it's like, a, because of microservices, there has to be that further test, so it's not just the general spec flow unit test, you have to do that extra level of making sure the communication's tested properly, so you are getting the right responses back, so you've got that, Feeling. So if you do change a contract, you need to make sure that the other places are aware of it. But it's a question of how much, how much testing you do. You know, you've got combination, combinatorial explosion of a number of services, you know, and the different paths through those services. A, a, a good measure, I think, is to always ask you the question, yourself the question, if you think you've got too many tests at a particular level, is to ask yourself how many times you see them fail. Um, if they never fail, then they're probably not actually much use. Um, so an example would be we, we had uh, nearly 200 integration tests that actually went off and used the website and proved that it all worked. In fact, we probably just needed nine because whenever one failed, it actually it was actually like a quarter of the one fail at a time because you fundamentally broke something. But you, you delete the you delete um, all of them and just have the nine tests. But we end up with actually it's a really fast feedback loop. And we know we've broken something really quickly. Which is a good point, but it's completely orthogonal to microservices. It is. It is. But, but, it's one so so no, but, but it may, it may help if, if, if the explosion of integration tests occur because of the communications between your mic between the application, the microservices, etc. And you're trying to prove all these things. A lot of the time, a happy case test, a single happy case test, will prove that you've got your connections between. Yeah, but so one of the things. Uh, just before we move on to anything else, I think maybe we should carry this on in the pub. Mm -hmm. I'm very aware that it's very hot here, and lots of people have visited some uncomfortable chairs for quite a while. So, I guess, in conclusion, microservices are pretty hot. <laughs> <laughs>